Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, um, it's a great opportunity to be able to come and talk with you. I know some of you are here in the audience, some I haven't seen for a while, but I go back a long way, some decades, in fact. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people here, or a nation, it's, and their, part, their history of sharing learnings and the way in which they did. I think there is a huge amount for us to reflect upon as we come to this um, reflection on the, this 21st century disease and the impact it's had on many people, including Aboriginal people, but also um, what a past life and a way of sharing learnings and a way of living um, might be different. Also, I want to acknowledge that what I'm talking about today um, relates to the work of many, many colleagues and uh, has come from interactions with huge numbers of people, both within this state, around Australia and elsewhere. Now, let's, as we come to this, let's think about, obviously, these are some of the descriptions uh, that have been used. The World Health Organization calls it one of today's most blatantly visible yet most neglected public health problems and goes on to describe an escalating global epidemic of overweight and obesity, which is taking over many parts of the world. The World Obesity Federation calls it the millennium disease. Now, these are strong and emotive words indeed. As we start, I want us to recognise this is where I'm starting from. It's a serious chronic relapsing disease. It's highly prevalent among adults in Australia and globally. But is it an issue, really, children and young people? This is how I'm going to start with my talk. So how much of a problem is obesity in children and young people? So I want your interactions here. I want you to tell me. Now, what percentage, what proportion in each group in Australia is affected by overweight and obesity? So let's think about school-age children. What do you think? Combined overweight and obesity. Any numbers that anybody could think about? And you're so, 25%. Any, anyone higher, lower? It's it's on the school. Ends on the school. Actually, school, those yeah. are both correct. Yeah. So it's about yeah. one in four, about 7% have obesity. What about school age adolescents? Would that be higher or lower? Higher. Indeed, that is the case. Um, obesity tends to accrete with age. Um, what about four to five year olds when they're starting school? What prevalence do you think it is then? Maybe 10%. That's what most people say. It's actually 20%. Most kids affected by overweight or obesity in adolescence are already affected by it at the time of school entry. Lots of implications then for where intervention may need to occur. What about Indigenous children and young people? Would they be higher or lower in terms of their prevalence? No. Lower, higher. In fact, it is higher, 28% at school entry, higher in adolescence and higher still in adulthood. And what about children of Middle Eastern background who speak a Middle Eastern language at home? Higher or lower? Which, which Middle Eastern language is asking? Okay. Um, this is, the, uh, this is what was asked from the New South Wales Health Survey, what languages do you speak? They group them together. They, as adolescents, would they be higher or lower? Right. Indeed, a lot higher, 42% with overweight and obesity um, in our schools, so school-aged children and young people, um, 5 to 15-year-olds. Okay, um, so we have seen this increase in prevalence of overweight and obesity. So this is from nationally representative surveys from the 1985 through to 2014 over about a 30-year period, and you can see the increase, particularly between 1985 and 1995. And in fact, that tended to happen in most OECD, westernised countries, in the 1985 to 1995 region. Interesting to reflect on what that might be um, as a result of, you know, I think we can only just reflect on that. And then a relative plateauing over that period of time. So currently we've got about one in four affected, and we've got a relative plateauing in the last 10 years, still at unacceptably high levels, but with nuances. 
So if we look at central obesity, and this is using waist to height ratio, um, but we know that central obesity is associated with more cardiometabolic risk. We can see that that's gone up over time, more children with more central obesity. We know that's been happening with adults as well. So this is of concern because that's associated with more cardiometabolic outcomes. But what I want to particularly highlight, if we're alluding to this before, is that there's a growth in social disparities. So if you look, this is New South Wales data from school specific activity and nutrition survey, if you look at what's been happening to, so if we look at kids based on their postcode, so a pretty rough measure, but a reasonable measure of socioeconomic status. And then you look at in the green, here you can see those in the um, highest tertile of socioeconomic status. They've had a prevalence rate that's probably about one in five over obesity, and that's been pretty static from the mid 2000s to um, 2015. If you look at those who are orange, they've also had a static prevalence rate, a slightly higher rate, 22 to 23%. If you look at kids in the lowest socioeconomic status region based on postcode, those in blue, they're starting at a higher rate, 26%, and it's worsening. About one in three in 2015 affected by overweight and obesity. This makes sense if you you only have to have your eyes open as you walk around different parts of Sydney, if you go to different west fields, different parts of this country, uh, this state, in this city, you can see dramatic differences in the background prevalence of overweight and obesity. And these data highlight that we've got growing social disparities, and there's a lot of implications there about how you might intervene if our interventions are only focused on things that really are picked up by PLOs, people like ourselves well-educated um, people with a degree of um, self-efficacy, then we're going to drive inequities happening. But it's also very prevalent at the global level. Now, I want your thoughts on this, and what countries you think lead in terms of child and adolescent obesity rates? Mm -hmm. Give me some ideas. Give me some countries, please. Mexico. Mexico. <laughs> Good point. Mexico. Hilarious. USA. Did you mean Americas or no, USA? 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 Australia. Australia? Middle, Middle East. Middle East. Any others? Okay. So I'm going to... Let me... Okay. Now, there's a great website, the NCD Risk Factor Collaboration Web website, which has put together data from enormous numbers of high-quality cohort studies, including... Philippine cohort study in Western Sydney that we were involved with <coughs> um, has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of data points and has had several papers published in the Lancet documenting these. Tremendous website where you can look at a whole range of things, including diabetes, risk, hypertension, and so on. But I want to show you the data for obesity, and I'm, just for the purposes of this, initially I'm showing girls. So the hotter the colour, the higher the prevalence. Now, you can clearly see that the USA has a really high prevalence, but look at the Middle East, North Africa, look at South America, particularly um, Chile, um, um, Argentina, look at South Africa, um, look at New Zealand. Which is a country of Montana. Which is the country of Montana. <laughs> That's, that's Alaska. <laughs> and now, I want you to look at um, Asia in particular, because I'm going to show you some changes now. Look at China in particular. Um, these are girls. Now, this is school age children. I'm now going to show you boys. Wow. A new meaning to the word red China. <laughs> um, but what you can see is that there can be gender differences, not, not that much in Australia, but certainly in China. And this phenomenon has been called the little emperor syndrome or the um, you know, one child policy where you've got one child, two parents or grandparents, highly, um, highly loved and overloved perhaps young children. But um, there is a high prevalence of obesity in boys in several Asian countries. And you can see that being picked up in some of the uh, data here. So now that's a fairly broad-based way of doing this. Let's have a look at 
what you can also see from the NCD Risk Factor Collaboration uh, website. So you can actually look at the rank ordering of these countries. Now, in fact, the highest prevalence was in countries that you really couldn't see there because they were too small. But let me read out the first countries, the top ones. Nauru, Cook Islands, Palau, Tonga, Tuvalu, Nu, French Polynesia, American Samoa, Marshall Islands, Tokelau, Kiribati, Samoa, Micronesia, okay? They're the first 13 countries. This is the Pacific. This is why that's called, this is paradise lost, as Paul Zimmer has talked about it. This is the cloak of colonisation there. there are dramatic changes there. So they, they're battling with the rise of diabetes. They've also got climate change. Mm. This is overwhelming for these countries. But then let me tell you some of the next countries. Kuwait, USA, coming at number 15, Egypt, Puerto Rico, Bermuda, Bahamas, so the Caribbean high risk. Then you've got some other, um, uh, other countries. New Zealand comes at 23. <laughs> um, in fact, Australia ranks number 53 for obesity prevalence in girls and fifth for the OECD countries, behind Mexico and New Zealand and USA. And it's number eight boys. So um, we still have very high prevalence rates, but there are some countries where it's a very significant issue. And if you work in Western Sydney like I do, where we have large numbers of people from the Pacific, uh, Middle East, parts of Asia, um, no wonder we have very high prevalence of people with pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes in our clinics, um, in the adult services, but also um, in pediatric services. So what are the health consequences? Just going to tell you briefly, um, you won't be surprised to realise that this is a disease that really um, affects basically every body system. I'm actually trained as a general paediatrician, not an endocrinologist, um, but I've ended up having to learn quite a bit of endocrinology because there are a lot of endocrine complications, but there's also fatty liver disease, obstructive sleep apnea, um, orthopedic complications and a range of cardiovascular um, risk factors and so on. <coughs> and there are also long-term risks. So these are immediate risks. There are also long-term risks for, um, of childhood obesity because increased risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes in adulthood, increased risk of a range of cancers in adulthood. And particularly if you have severe obesity, increased risk of psychosocial dysfunction in in women, in young adults. So we don't take this lightly. I certainly don't take it So we do see this more, however, in those with severe obesity and those who are adolescents. So we have seen a rise in obstructive sleep apnea, in insulin resistance and pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. When I was a medical student in the 1970s and a young uh, pediatric um, registrar resident, in the 1980s, we never learned about type 2 diabetes in the, con in the context of children. Now, it's about 10% of kids in this state who have diabetes have type 2 diabetes. I was in Darwin at the end of last week, Menzies School, the Health Research Centre for Health Research Institute, um, which was looking at, at, at their sort of diabetes and pregnancy in young people. And they feel that they may have two or three hundred young people with type 2 diabetes in the Northern Territory, and the whole population is only 110,000. And that's overwhelming. What that means for those communities and people who cross hugely disproportionately um, Indigenous young people who are represented there. Um, we've also seen this rise in major orthopaedic complications. So this is slipped and more tracheal femoral disease. Um, so we've seen this dramatic rise in those. So we are seeing more of these people each year, and these are measures really of more severe obesity. And our health systems really have to be caught up with that. So the sleep unit, diabetes, the pre-diabetes unit, the um, orthopedic unit are all you know grappling with this and haven't necessarily got all the resources that we need. So have these, and these are more likely in those with severe obesity and central nervous system. Um, but it's interesting, I think we think, oh yes, that's an issue with you know, older kids adults severity but let me show you some data that we did looking at 
it's aged between two and five years of age. And we had an interdated, so we looked at their health system usage. So this was a follow-up of children um, who were a, a, took part in a clinical study, uh, but an intervention around healthy, healthy eating and activity um, with mothers of uh, you know, newborn babies. And we uh, looked at their MBS, PBS, et cetera, usage. And let me just show you. So we have kids classed as healthy weight, those with overweight, and those with obesity. And we looked at both to see non hospital um, costs of healthcare use, hospital costs, emergency costs, and medicines use. And what we found was that those kids, like these are two to four year olds, because those kids with obesity then really did have about 1.6 times the healthcare costs of those who have a healthy weight or were classified as overweight. And they're 2.6 times more likely to hospitalise for things like ENT and respiratory disease. So these are the first data showing it. It's even having an effect subtle um, in, even before they get to school, that there's actually an in, increased interaction with the health system for some reasons. So it's definitely a prevalent problem. So it's why I take it very seriously. And now, it's now a global health policy. Um, the World Health Organization, um, the previous Director General Margaret Chan, established an um, End to Childhood Obesity um, Commission, ECHO Commission, because it's such an issue in low and middle income countries, the Pacific, North Africa, Middle East, um, South, the, the South Americans, and so on. And what it strategies to think how can we deal with this because they realized they needed to work across traditional uh, traditional silos within who i was involved in um, one of the working parts and um, they came up with six main recommendations um, i can talk later on about pros or cons of those but i want to pick up on a couple of the areas here you can see um, these are pretty sensible they have you know reflect the need for upstream issues as well I want to first talk about weight management because we have so many people affected by it. Prevention is vital, we're going to come and talk about it. It's really important for the community who are already affected by this problem. And it's not just adults who need to be managed. The important as that is, these children and young people who are affected also need to be treated. So, can it really be treated? Um, what's the evidence for this? Well, there have been numerous studies and i've just got the logos from a few of the studies i've been involved with we love um, logos and we love acronyms and one of the nice things is that um, words like um, eating and activity are vowels so it's tremendous so you end up with lots of really good um, acronyms as well um, we're currently running the fast track study um, so these have been done in community settings hospital clinics and group ones individual ones, drug therapy, behavioural interventions, different types of intensity, different age groups. You know, and the issue is how do you make sense of all this? Well, of course, good evidence-based people, we decide that we'll go to the Cochrane collaboration. We'll have a look and do this Cochrane review on interventions. This is um, the first one that came up in 2009. And they said, well, yes, actually, when you look at these 60-odd studies that were included, a behavioural program with lifestyle interventions that involves the family does lead to decreases in overweight in a year or two compared with standard care. And um, in fact, a subsequent systematic review, well, in fact, it can improve the cardiometabolic risk factors as well LDL, cholesterol, triglycerides, insulin. Yay! The data kept accumulating. There's so many more studies that have come now more granularity. And the, that one Cochrane review has now become six sub, sub has, has given birth to six children. Um, you know, some looking at diet, some looking at some, you know, some looking at this, um, drug intervention, some looking at surgery, some looking at different age groups and so on. Um, and so the data do say look there are some common principles that we can use. So you do need to manage the kids' the complications. If someone has orthopedic complications, they need to see what they've got. Um, you know, if they're limping, maybe you should take a hip x-ray. 
if they have this flooring and you know when they go on the school camp the school teacher stays awake thinking the child is going to die overnight unless she monitors the breathing i had several patients like that maybe they need a fairly urgent sleep assessment um, if they've got roaring acanthosis in the family history of type 2 diabetes maybe they need to have some endocrine review or um, so on. but you also need this conventional approach about family-based lifestyle and so it does involve we know you have to involve the family anybody has you know, i'm sure you would all really recognize this you need to be developmentally appropriate a four-year-old is different from a 14 year old the level of engagement of a young person depends on their maturity and their of course, you've got to have long term behaviour change, which is why you need the family. Of course, it needs to look at dietary change. Of course, it needs to look at increased physical activity and decreased sedentary behaviours, and they're not the reverse of each other. They're two different types of behaviours that can sit alongside them. Think of the sportsman who spent a lot of time doing on screens, they're separate behaviours. We do need to look at long term weight strategies just as we know in adults we need to do in kids we've got, we've got poorer long term we've got poorer data on that and there is a role for additional therapies like more intensive dietary therapies and our group kids hospital is really interested in these pharmacotherapy but we have a very limited armamentarium nick may well talk about some of the drug therapies available and bariatric surgery for which there was a real role in young people as well but hugely not available i chaired actually just on that i chaired the college of physicians college of surgeons working group that actually developed these strategies and recommendations about this basically is age 15 and above with a bmi of 40 um, or 35 with um and above with comorbidities and there's a whole lot of things about um having experienced surgical units working with adolescent units actually provide this Anyway, um, but <coughs> all of that's but complicated. I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts. If you if you were a primary care physician, you have seen someone for the first time, I just wanted to give some brief advice. What sort of brief advice do you think might be useful for a family um, where there's a young person who is above a healthy weight? Do you think there are some simple things that you could be helping families to think about or reflect? Any key messages that you think we use that are likely to be helpful and not unhelpful? Any ideas from the um, audience here? Yes, I can tell them. I was already. You you print out the eight for healthy weight strategy. Thank you. I'm going to show you that very soon. I'll tell you how we got any that we're doing. Okay, so pick pick those and don't stop doing them. Yeah. Small sustainable changes in the whole family do it. Can we climb you, please? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that sounds wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay, do people have any, any other additional comments? They have anything that they particularly like to raise or talk about? Well, yes. I was just going to say, in particular, but even though every message is um, tricky because of the big social stigma. That is involved with this, you and if parents will feel, feel guilty or it's just a mindset. Yeah, so just, just picking this up for the audience um, who might be listening. So, the issue about being aware of the social stigma and about how you deal with that. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about stigma in, um, in our questions later on, but the issue about the language you use, in fact, I reflect now, I didn't put in my I haven't got a particular focus in this talk here, but I do talk about it. The issue about the language is really important. So we often talk about above a healthy weight, well above a healthy weight. Um, we are non-blaming, and I think it really helps to recognise obesity as a disease, largely a physiological response to a pathological environment, um, rather than some uh, moral um, inadequacy of the family. Nevertheless, you, need, you do need to work with the family and you, you do need to help them. So in fact, um, can I just go on? Um, we talked about eight for a healthy weight. This came from group, um, with leadership from the New South Wales Ministry of Health and Sydney Children's Hospital Network. 
that, um, but also a whole group of paediatric clinicians across the state, we actually now meet fortnightly on every Tuesday morning, we have done so for the last two years, and one of our concepts comes, we want to make it easy for clinicians, GPs, secondary level cares, tertiary level care clinicians who are seeing kids, doctors, nurses, and our health, to have some key messages that we use, can we make it easy? So this was developed um, based on some original work. And these are essentially come, almost all of these come from the Australian Dietary Guidelines or the National Physical Activity and Sydney Behaviour Guidelines. Um, essentially work for anyone over the age of about two. Um, and so they talk about drinking water, um, two plus five in terms of fruit and veg, if you're a bit younger, healthy breakfast, um, the one about portion sizes, we spend a lot of time working with eating disorders groups to ensure that this message, because it is actually really important, that we do eat more. One of something now is more than one of something some time ago. A portion is bigger now than it used to be some decades ago. So know your portion of serve size. Healthy snacks, keep the screen time possible, but for less than two hours, um, an hour a day is back to being get enough sleep. And then do it, be healthy together. And we've got versions of that modified a bit in a range of community languages. Um, and those are really well. And I think those have ended up being the most popular things. They've essentially been around for about a, about a year and a half. And I think they're incredibly um, Ministry of Health is around trying to place it everywhere up in the pediatric LHDs, but it's really available on the websites. Now, I want to just come to something that's a little bit more. Um, in tech, you know, I mentioned that we were interested in more intensive dietary therapies. I um, had a fantastic PhD student who worked with young people with newly fairly newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. She put them on a very low energy diet, BLED, under really good dietetic control uh, support. Um, two months of really great support around really turning around um, dietary intake. So rather than the traditional changing to a more healthy intake overall, let's do a more intensive dietary intervention. What you can see here is that um, baseline um, at, yeah, so we've got outcomes at eight and uh, 34 weeks, so 34 weeks is the white bars. And we had five young people that actually had, you know, real weight loss and continued weight loss. And we had three young people who didn't eat here this and found it more difficult, and it is challenging. Um, but those who did it here, all of those had um, a remission of their diabetes, um, certainly at the time that we finished the study. That doesn't mean it stayed away forever, by no means. But it does highlight that, and this was based on data also that had come from adults, but we've now using this much more routinely in young people who've got um, metabolic complications of their severe obesity. So does treatment work? Well, the answer is yes. Lifestyle intervention can work in those who are treatment seeking. Um, medium success, provided it's available. But there's a whole heap of research questions that we still don't know. Different settings, different doses. What about special patient groups? What about those with severe obesity? What about Indigenous young people and culturally and linguistically diverse people? What about What's most cost effective? How do we do weight maintenance? And what about role of bariatric surgery? There's a lot of questions that are still essentially unanswered. So if anybody's really interested in doing a PhD, come and have a chat to me because there's a lot of questions to answer. And it's also really difficult to translate that into routine clinical service. Um, I wish I worked in the service, as I'm sure all of you that have all the resources we needed to provide um, the level of care that's um, Required for a clinical practice guideline, you know, to do that. So I have patients where the issues of poverty and cultural diversity um, create challenges in being able to provide really good service to them. We have patients with learning disabilities and developmental disorders, patients with low literacy or illiteracy or dependence. Um, how do we communicate when we, we don't normally think about this? So about the family in crisis or psychiatric disorders. Now, the reality is that obesity, severe obesity, is more common in families with this background. Now, our service is oriented towards providing that support, which we need to modify those. 
the other issue is um, that not everyone really is capable of the risk of actually coming through the services that they can offer treatment. So here, here we have this a data from the Beach Data Center. Services around Australia. There were 40, this includes 40,000 children aged 2 to 17 years, routine monitoring of GP services. So here are 200 children in Australia. Of every 200 children visiting to the doctor, 60 is overweight or obesity. And 23 have obesity. So, and that, so that's a, so that's 30%. Yeah, that's higher than the background for And certainly when this was done in the mid um, you know, a decade ago, one was offered a penny full of treatment. Now, there's a lot of barriers to this. These are exactly the same issues in secondary tertiary care services. It's not that GP or primary, uh, secondary level, tertiary level care um, health professionals are being slapped. It's because there are all huge numbers of barriers providing these forms of treatment. Um, time, resources, where do you refer people to? Perhaps a lack of training, difficult issue, can't be done with in a hurried way, and so on. But, so part of this is how do we reorient the health services a bit? Essentially, we've got a 21st century health system in an overstretched health problem, in an overstretched health system. So how do we respond? How do our health systems do this? So one of the ways I like to think of it is with the chronic disease care period, where you're which is being used in thinking about heart disease or type 2 diabetes and so on. So we see you have this underpinning of primary, primary prevention and health promotion. You absolutely need that. And in fact, that, if I could do it, that should be like enormous. That should be the biggest part of it. And the bulk of people who are affected can be managed in um, community settings by their GPs, through group programs and so on. Um, that could be family-based or self-based care. Um, there are a group of people maybe, you know, and that's probably about 70%. Yeah. There's a group of other people who have higher risk, need more specialist teams, specialist allies, well, secondary level care services. And there's a group of patients with complex disease, with tertiary care, highly joined up services. And uh, of course there are patients who need barrier surgery. Part of this. And I think this is the case. Well, this is the case for adult services, it's really what we need pediatric services as well. And yet we have so much missing in many areas. Now, one of the ways that New South Wales Health and Children's Hospital Network have responded is um, around thinking how do we support people to get the skills of all those levels of skills? So um, we developed over a number of years the way that kids see <coughs> learning modules. That are now freely available on the Healthy Kids for Professionals website and the um, Health Education Training Institute website. Um, and it's basically designed for nurses, allied health, or medical, junior or senior, primary, secondary, or tertiary level. So you can choose what you want to do. Because it's, there are, haven't been a lot of training programs. And uh, it's at the that section of the website that you can use. And this is one of the resources there. Now, let me come back to the World Health Organization issue. Um, the book uh, before about weight management. One of the other issues was um, early childhood diets. I did this is going to be on the presentation. I want to tell you a little bit about this during the prevention. Why might you want to be interested in your five? Well, one in five kids are already affected at the time they come to school. Um, we know that infant feeding, diet, early feeding patterns, sedentary behaviours influence obesity onset and are well established in those first few years. And most kids who gain excess weight before, before puberty actually gained it prior to school entry. And yet, most obesity prevention programs are actually aimed at school age. So, you know, it's a bit too late in one sense. So, in that context, um, my colleagues and I, um, my colleagues in what was in Sydney Southwest Area Health Service, now Sydney LHD, um, conducted the very first trial to try to prevent obesity in early childhood, called the Healthy Beginnings Trial. There's been another that have come since then. 
Um, we were interested in home visiting programs. We knew that could be helpful for families with um, particularly disadvantaged families. <coughs> so we wondered um, what could be their role in the prevention of obesity in their childhood. So we looked at a moderately intensive home visiting program. It was essentially eight visits over two years, one prior to pregnant, you know, birth of the baby, five in the second year, and then two in the third, um, so five in the first year of life and then two in the second year of life. It was a randomised controlled trial conducted um, with mothers recruited from Campbelltown and Liverpool hospitals. And had just staged developmentally appropriate messages that were delivered by a child and family nurse rest is best, no solids for me until six months, etc. So not controversial, very standard health promotion messages. Well, what did we find? Well, um, in those who received the intervention as opposed to those who didn't, there was an increase in breastfeeding duration. Um, at 12 months, improvements in the range of infant feeding, improvements at 24 months in child feeding and um, not eating in front of the TV and some um, maternal activity measures, plus a decrease in BMI. Let me show you the data. Um, here we show BMI, um, and what you can see here, first of all, and you can see in red is the kids who received the intervention, and in blue is the kids who have control. And um, I just need to point out to you, healthy BMI in kids is actually quite a lot lower, particularly at this age, than in adults. So don't get worried at all. I can't see the adult range there. In fact, the um, a BMI in this age group of 18.2 is equivalent to adult BMI of 25. So overall. This is in two-year-olds. What we had shown was a shift to the left. We essentially, um, and we found a significant difference between those who received this intervention as opposed to those with controls. And we'd actually decreased the prevalence of overweight and obesity from about 18% to 15%. Well, we were ecstatic. The first trial of prevent obesity in early childhood, and bloody fantastic. Oh, so that's been reported, etc. We felt great about it. And, you know, a lot of in international interest in the trial, which continues. Um, but are the effects sustained? Let's just take away the intervention. Let's just follow them up at three and a half and five years, which was very good scientifically. To do this, let me show you. Well, this is the control data. This one you can see, oh, at three and a half and five years, the control BMIs are decreasing. Now, just to remind you, that's normal. In healthy kids, natural BMI naturally decreases from two to three to age five. You're at your relative skinniest in your whole of your life at about school entry. You're a two year old, and then you're a sort of a skinnier five year old. That's normal. It's healthy childhood growth. But well, let's look at the kids who had the intervention up or from three and a half to five years. No difference. We did try torturing the statistician, made no difference. <laughs> we could not find anything, absolutely nothing. So um, it wasn't just BMI, it was in the, all the other measures that, that we did. So um, how do we reflect on this? Was it? The original home visiting intervention effective because it was delivered in a disadvantaged area on the background of few well child services with a population that by and large was of um, more socially disadvantaged and a higher proportion of mothers who were migrants and so on. So, does that suggest to us that the more intensive interventions may be most effective in the more vulnerable families? But the effect went away. Um, but it may not be sustained without further intervention, and as that suggests that you don't stop. The broader, obesity conducive environment beyond the unit family must be addressed. Can't just set the go away. And I think this highlights, and other studies that we've done highlight, the importance of a suite of interventions acting across the development, um, across, yeah, at every development stage across the life course. So if you think about this from pre-pregnancy to infancy, adolescence, going out of family, families, workers, midlife, and so on. 
there needs to be different types of interventions as you encounter different issues. You can't just set and forget because we're dealing with multiple factors that have led to this. Now, we've had a whole range of other, uh, several other groups in Australia started doing somewhat similar studies at the same time. Um, and we, uh, these came together and we, in fact, we now have a centre of research activities that comes with that. We've combined the data in what's called prospective meta-analysis and showed that if you have some form of intervention starting in those first few months, or probably antenatally, you can get to lead to moderate reduction in BMI 18 to 24 months, improvements in breastfeeding and TB time, and in some undesirable feeding practices they're following on. Now, just to tell you about the Healthy Beginnings trial. We've now doing a whole range of things related to the Healthy Beginnings trial. That was done in the context of health promotion service. We're now filing um, SMS and phone coaching versions of that um, and, and in a range of different language groups, particularly in, in Sydney local health district, um, Sydney South Wales local health district, and some other local health districts as well. We've also incorporated elements of Healthy Beginnings into the um, maternal home visiting or the sustained home visiting services for vulnerable families. It's also been picked up in some of those um, sustained home visiting services in several other countries internationally. And there are active versions, yes, developed here in Sydney, but also in developed in some other countries. So we're seeing this as as quite an, an example of how you might integrate some of these key messages into routine services. Um, so our group has come together as NHMRC Centre of Research Excellence, and we have a really great domain name, earlychildhoodobesity.com, fantastic name. And uh, we've got a huge range of work that we're working on together to, to come up with um, policy and practice relevant research. And, it's the most amazing experience of working with tremendous people across Australia and New Zealand. I'm the director of the group. Um, we've got health economists, we've got people interested in measurement, we've got trialists, we've got policy people. It's quite amazing. But as I finish, I just want us to think about the world in which our children and all of us live. What I was talking about there was really quite downstream, it was around the child. I think that's really important. Let's think more broadly. Part of my weekly world, I think about this. I'm living in a very diverse world. There's been dramatic changes in our food and respect and sleep environments over the last few decades. This is our cultural wallpaper. This is the world in which children and we live. And are we tackling these influences? So I want us just to think a little bit more broadly about this. Well, what is now the world of this situation? Um, as this concept is now over 20 years old, um, thinking about what, um, how these things relate. So if you think about energy expenditure and food intake at an individual level, these things are influenced quite profoundly at the work, school, or home environment, things like the availability and level of leisure, um, activity facilities, or work site environments, family and home environments and school physical activity and food environments profoundly depends on where you are not what this is influencing what you eat in your level of physical activity those things are in turn influenced profoundly at a community level by the availability of knowledge transport that is public safety types of foods that are available relative to amount of manufactured and ordered foods versus agricultural gardens local markets, those things in turn influenced at a national or regional level by transport policy, urbanisation, um, food and nutrition policy, and those things in turn influenced at an international level with things like by the amazing globalisation of markets. So it's quite a complex causal pathway. Most of what we've been doing has been down that right end of the spectrum, but the issue and those, but most of these factors lie well beyond the capacity of the individual, family, or the health sector, or the health minister to modify. And why we need a trans-sectoral and whole-of-government and whole-of-community approach. 
And this is quite challenging, requires great political leadership and community ownership. So it's these upstream issues that need to be dealt with, and these are the ones we're really not talking about. So if I think about some examples of what should be tackled, I include things like regulation of food marketing to children, um, a soft food tax, as per Mexico and some of the United States and some of other European countries, South Africa. Or have we got really good consumer friendly information about food and clean nutrients, particularly if we don't have um, high education? What about urban transport and planning policies around public transport infrastructure and active environments, active transport? And what about the availability and cost of healthy food choices, particularly in remote regional areas, schools, workplaces? What about inequity and poverty? These issues are really profoundly important. So we really do need to look at this carefully. We really do need to think about different ways of thinking, doing policy. Real changes are to occur, but that is a big, big challenge. So I want to leave you with my final comments about the major health issue, the rising social disparity, the need for high quality treatment, and that obesity prevention needs to occur in many ways across the life course, in many settings, across sectors, and especially for the most socially disadvantaged. And home visiting interventions may be part of the part of that. I want to leave the acknowledgements for a whole range of amazing people with whom I work. And I want to say thank you.